welcome to episode 53 of the Monday Night Review. It's finally sunny here. It's an absolute dream. I've spent the day uh, hanging out with ducks and chickens. But today's episode has definitely been one that stays with you when you've started doing it. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about that today. I'd like to give a big shout out to our newest Pendle Witch on Patreon, Catherine Hughes. Thank you so much for signing up. I've already got two recommendations from you, so I'm really excited to get into those. For anyone else wanting to sign up to the Patreon, you can check us out on Patreon, Monday Night Review. There'll be a link in the show notes. Last week's obviously contained a spelling error because that's how I roll, but I'll try and get it right this week. Two of the fav- my favourite episodes have involved like weird disappearances or kind of, yeah, people, people who have vanished or people who have died having disappeared or died somewhere where they shouldn't have been. And today's episode is kind of along those lines. I never, one of the huge internet online cases that everyone is into is the Elisa Lam case which I've never found that fascinating my opinion of of that case is that sadly she was off her meds and uh, bad things happened to her whether I'm not right or not um, that's the explanation that I share with a lot of people I think being off your medication is can do really weird things to you and so I think that probably explains her behavior and how she ended up where she did but the case we're talking about today I have no explanation there are theories as to what happened initially but in terms of the outcome we know nothing Today we're going to be talking about the most famous disappearance on YouTube the vanishing of Lars Matank Lars Metank was born on the 9th of February 1986 in Berlin in Germany. He then, his family moved to a town in the north of Germany. He worked at a power plant. He had friends, he had a girlfriend, he was close with his family. At the time that this all took place, he was 28 and seemingly a very normal, well-rounded 28-year-old guy. He was healthy. He went out with friends. Some places say that he likes to travel. Uh, Other people have have it that the trip that he goes on is his first time leaving Germany. Make of that what you will. Um, He's very close with his parents and his family. And after his dad suffers a stroke, he often drives back to his parents' home to help his mother care for his father until his father is healthy. So he kind of puts his parents' well-being at the time over his own social life or anything, which, you know, it's nothing to write home about maybe, but it gives you a rounder idea of what Lars is like. He is a very good, friendly, nice, all-rounder guy. So... On the 30th of June 2014, 28-year-old Lars travels with four or five friends, uh, five friends, I believe, to Varna in Bulgaria. So some reports say that this is his first time travelling outside Germany. Others say that he uh, travels often. But either way, this group of friends is going to spend a few days at the Golden Sands, which is a seaside resort just outside of Varna. Now, this is a kind of everything's there resort. It's basically a tourist place where people go to go drinking, clubbing, swimming pools, beachside. It's that sort of resort. And that's what the friends do. They spend the day on the beach, swimming, playing football, relaxing, and then they go clubbing and drinking in the evening. By all accounts, Lars is in a very relaxed and good mood. There are a couple of things that I'm going to flag. Now, the problem is, is that this is one of those stories that is so all over social media and all over YouTube that it's difficult to tell Chinese whispers 
I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to say Chinese whispers anymore, but I don't know what you are supposed to say. Do let me know. So I'm going to flag a few things. They may or may not be true. One friend allegedly says that Lars doesn't eat much while he's there. He has salad or soup at mealtimes. So whether it's not great food, whether he's not keen on Bulgarian food, don't know how it differs from, from German food, but, you know, we've all been places where the local food doesn't really uh, float our boat. So whether it's dislike or distrust of the food, whether, you know, we've all gone away and got a slightly upset stomach and you think I'm just going to stick with bland stuff or going out, drinking loads, being on the beach, all of that. He just wasn't as hungry. Some people don't get as hungry. He looks like fit, healthy guy. I'll put pictures up on uh, social media for you to see. So... It could also be that that's actually just how he ate. He was just a conscientious eater. And the friend who commented that he ate soups or salads most mealtimes didn't really know what his eating habits were like. So it was remarkable for him, but actually that's how Lars ate. And he's one of those commendable people who has self-restraint while on holiday. Not me. They're having a good time. On the 6th of July 2014, the day before they're supposed to return home, they go out to a local bar and Lars gets into an argument with some other German nationals over football. Lars is a Werder Bremen fan. The others support Bayern Munich. And this, again, is not much to write home about. I've lived with men all of my adult life. I've lived with football fans all of my adult life. Football fallings out do happen. Now, there's no physical violence in this altercation. His friends come and pull him out. It seems to be a sort of drunk football fans being Larry as they are. So it, around 4am, it seems, the friends decide to go and get some food and they go to a local McDonald's. Now, Lars doesn't want anything from McDonald's and says he's going to wait outside for his friends. But when they come out, he's disappeared. So either he wasn't hungry or he didn't eat McDonald's or fast food. Some reports think that he deliberately left the group to go off on his own. The friends think it's kind of weird. He said he'd wait outside and then he's not there. But they think that maybe he's gone back to the hotel so they go back to the hotel there's no sign of him but he does turn up a few hours later and he says to the friends that he's been beaten up by four men that he says they're either Russian or Bulgarian and he's convinced that these men have been hired to beat him up by the group of football fans that he'd had a disagreement with in the bar now by all accounts these guys that he had a fight with are fellow germans so i don't know if i went to germany if i went to france and i fell out with someone and i wanted to hire someone to beat them up i don't know how i'd go about doing that seems very Random, if these people he'd had an argument with were Bulgarian, that would be something. But I don't know how, in a matter of hours, you go about organising someone to beat someone up. Also, if it's a group of Bayern Munich fans and they wanted to beat up Lars, surely they can just get him on his own outside the McDonald's and do it themselves. There's more on that to get into in a minute. So the friends are also confused because they were like, well, if the men approached Lars outside McDonald's, why didn't you come in to McDonald's to get your friends or to be with your friends or to be safe? Or... If you were lured away, what lured you away from waiting for your mates outside McDonald's? How did these guys know where you were going to be? Um, So 
they kind of think it's weird and that he's acting strangely, but they're, you know, we've all been out where friends have had a weird night or someone's been a bit sketchy and you think, okay, something's gone on, but that's fine. They're back. He's here now. They're due to go home the next day. Everything's fine. So whatever had happened, Lars was suffering with an injured jaw and a sore ear. And so the friends take him to the doctors, get him checked out. And the doctor says he's burst his eardrum. And as anyone who's burst an eardrum or damaged the eardrum will know, the doctor advises him not to fly. It could cause a lot of pain. And he pre- prescribes an antibiotic called Cefprozil. Now, Mitank's friends, Lars's friends, want to stay with him until he's ready to fly home, but he's very insistent. He says, go, I'll be fine. I'm going to uh, book into a cheaper hotel right near the airport. I'll be home in a couple of days. No point in you waiting for me. So he persuades them to, to go. There's a lot of controversy about this on the internet about how you never leave anyone behind. But I've got a theory on that. Anyway, so Lars checks out. When they all check out of the hotel, Lars checks out at the same time. But then they go to the airport and he goes to the hotel colour Varna for one night. It's cheaper. It's next to the airport. But when his friends leave, Lars seems to become very paranoid he calls his mother Sandra and in a whisper he tells her that people are trying to kill or rob him and that she needs to cancel his credit cards so she calls the bank and they say there's nothing unusual going on with his cards no one's done anything his account looks fine so she calls back Lars and he says she has to cancel the cards he's got enough cash to get him home So she does as he asks. Later that night, the closed circuit TV security camera in the hotel records him pacing up and down the halls, looking out of windows, hiding in a lift. And then at 1 a.m., he leaves the hotel, returning about an hour later. But we don't know where he goes during this hour, whether there isn't cctv or whether that cctv has disappeared or whether they never bothered looking again we'll discuss that later but he's out for an hour he comes back to the hotel and in the morning he calls his mother and says that the people who are following him are getting closer and she's obviously concerned he's there on his own he's been beaten up or something has happened to him, he's injured, but she knows that he's near the airport, he's got cash, he's coming home. She's she's helped him book onto a flight, and she says to him, you know, you need to go to the airport doctor and get signed off to fly. So on the 8th of July, 2014, Lars gets in a taxi, for the airport in loads of time for his flight so that he can get his ear checked by the airport doctor, who is Dr. Costa Kostov. The taxi driver would later say that Lars's pupils were really dilated, but this isn't mentioned by the airport doctor as far as I know. So Lars texts his mother to say that he's arrived at the airport, she's really relieved and happy, and she confirms to him that his flight is booked, everything can go ahead. We see Lars on the airport CCTV, he's wearing dark shorts, a really bright yellow t-shirt, he's got a backpack, he's carrying a bag, and he's walking into the doctor's office. So Dr Kostov would later describe his behaviour as nervous and erratic, But I'm guessing that you see a fair amount of that in airports because people are afraid of flying. So maybe it wasn't nervous or erratic enough for him to flag it at the time. According to Kostov, he told Lars that he was fine, his eardrum was fine and he could return home. He was safe to fly. 
he gets here it gets a little confused because some people say that he last didn't leave his office he expressed doubt about the medication he was taking um and Kostov apparently checks the online prescription system and it said Lars never filled the prescription. He never picked up his antibiotics. That's going to be important later. It's also interesting to note that allegedly Kostov changes his story three times, which is maybe why there's a bit of conflicting information about whether Lars was concerned about his the, the effects of his antibiotics, that his antibiotics hadn't been filled. Um, whatever happened... Lars is in the doctor's office and a construction worker wearing a high-vis jacket enters the doctor's office. Now, there's renovation work going on in that area of the airport at the time, so this isn't unusual. But Costa says that Lars began to visibly tremble and shouted, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I have to get out of here. And he gets up and he just flies out of the office, essentially. It is... His, you can see, it's it's sort of the prime example of fight or flight. It is flight. He just pegs it out of the office. He leaves behind all of his luggage, including his wallet, mobile phone, passport. He just legs it. So you can see the airport security footage where he races out of the office, then out of the airport building. And then apparently there's a bit of footage missing where he crouches down to hide from a police car. But you can see him kind of jogging away from the airport. And then he climbs over a fence and runs into a a wooded, grassy area that is near a forest, near the National A2 Highway. And that is literally the last we ever see of Lars Matank. There's never a body found there's never a confirmed sighting of Lars there's also no agreement among experts or family members as to what caused this weird behavior and whether his paranoia was rooted in an actual event whether he was paranoid due to a psychotic incident or a head injury or whether he was paranoid for good reason his mother says states you know there's no history of mental illness though of course it's always possible for someone to have a mental breakdown um or an undiagnosed mental illness that is triggered by an event but you know he's never had any mental illness issues before he's not on any medication um and it's basically it's ruled out in this case the internet says different So Lars's mother, alongside Bulgarian and German doctors, suspects that his behaviour was the result of a very rare side effect that can be caused by this antibiotic that that he's been prescribed for his ear, which is uh, cefprozil. Um, In some cases, it has been known to induce psychotic side effects including hallucinations and paranoia. However, according to Kostov, Lars didn't take this medication. He didn't go and pick up the cefprozil. Kostov says he didn't take those antibiotics. He didn't even fill out his prescription. So his behaviour couldn't have been a result of that. I can't think of a single reason why he left my office in such a panic. I'm still confused. It's a quote from the doctor. So there's loads of things for me that I want answers to that I think obviously everyone wants answers to that that I cannot explain. We don't know why he chose to run off and leave his friends the night that he allegedly got beaten up. His injuries show that something happened. You don't just perforate your eardrum. He had a jaw injury. Um. But for me, as I said earlier, I don't think football fans would put a hit out on someone. 
I rather suspect they're more likely to have spiked his drink, which could have resulted in his strange behaviour. I'm going to go into that more later. But if that is the case, I wonder if there are some guys out in the world feeling pretty fucking horrendous. So when the police come to a dead end in their investigation, which is pretty immediately, by all accounts, uh, Sandra hires a private investigator, Andreas Gutig. So Sandra flies out there the day after, uh, on the 9th of July, she flies there to look for her son and to try and galvanise the police force. So she, Lars has experience in hunting, fishing and trapping. He's confident outdoors. He camps, all of that. So there's a lot of scepticism about whether he'd be able to survive for long outdoors due to the intense heat of the summer and the lack of food. We know that he didn't have any anything with him, no wallet, no mobile or anything. Um, but his mother believes she he, she's... His mother believes that he is still alive, that he would be able to look after himself and that if he has lost his memory, he just has no way of getting home or help getting to anyone who can help him. About a year after his disappearance, a truck driver thought he saw him hitchhiking in Varna and there have, of course, been some reported sightings of him in several other countries, but none of them have been confirmed. So one theory believed by many is that he was having a psychotic break. He basically ran until he dropped down and died of dehydration. It's very hot at that time and we know he had nothing with him. Uh, we also have very little info on police searches, but for me this, this theory doesn't work because we see him jumping over a fence in a wooded area. So surely basic policing would involve searching that that immediate area from where we see him jumping over the fence he you know it's it's near an airport near a road it's not in the mis middle of a desert or a jungle so i would have assumed that they would conduct a search of the woodland and not found him he's wearing a neon yellow t-shirt you'd surely be able to work out in that heat with nothing a sort of perimeter of where to look so i don't know i i i feel like it's i feel like that is a very basic and often it's this you know i do understand that often it's the simplest <laughs> explanation it's the one but i don't know what's very interesting is that a, a couple of places bulgarians have put in their opinion one thought is that that varna has a big problem with organized crime with up to 40 percent of the population being involved in it and this would have the effect of making the police less likely to make an effort looking for someone it's also possible to make someone vanish and it could mean that the police really didn't bother with the search if they thought that he was involved in organised crime. But I don't know that someone who has nothing, no drug taking, no drink problem, anything, how you suddenly go and get involved in organised crime um, and I know that anything can happen to anyone, but I would have thought if you were wanting a drug mule, you use someone who you've enticed with drugs. You don't use someone who's who's not a drug taker. How are you going to... It j just doesn't fit for me. But another theory from those living in the area say that at the time in 2014, and now this is grim, there is a lot of trafficking for organs happening. And that is apparently what happened to Lars. Tourists were often targeted as they weren't aware of what was going on. It was easier to get them. And there would be a slower start for people to look for them. Because obviously, if you're not home, you're not with your family. Like, like with Lars, people might just think, oh, he's, he's gone off on his own. 
uh, this is a pretty bloody horrible possibility. He could definitely, as I mentioned earlier, he could definitely have had his drink spiked. Once you've spiked someone's drink, you can tell them, as we all know, with date rape, you can pretty much control them and you can keep spiking them. You can make them, you know, you can isolate them from their friends and get them where you need them to be. And so whether it's interesting that the construction worker triggered something for Lars, um, you obviously, they couldn't, they couldn't, um, predict that he was going to run out of the airport, but whether, I don't know if we've spoken to the construction worker and whether he's been verified, but whether that was a trafficker coming in to get him out of the doctor's office under the guise of being a construction worker, I don't know. But the, I I tend to um, put a bit more weight on the stories that come from the locals because obviously they're going to know more about what's going on than a British woman sitting on her sofa in Hampshire. Something that sounds quite possible, one of one of my top possibilities is that Lars, whether he did get beaten up or whether he hit his head, he fell over and damaged, do you know what I mean, hit his head and did something. Whatever happened, if he suffered a brain injury at the same time as bursting his eardrum, this would explain his dilated pupils and his odd behaviour. It doesn't make the either of the doctors who saw him look good. Um, I would assume that they would shine the light in. I mean, they seem to shine your a light into your eyes at any given opportunity. So I'm pretty sure if someone came in and said they'd been hit around the head, they had this perforated eardrum, they had a sore jaw, that you would shine a light into the pupils and that would flag a um you know that would flag a brain injury but it would explain the dilated pupils it would explain the odd behavior it would explain the kind of ongoing odd behavior that his friends don't seem concerned enough to stay with him now there's a lot of hoo-ha on the internet about how you never leave a man behind and all of that but i think the, the thing is if he was behaving normally and seemed okay then they they wouldn't feel bad leaving him if i think if he'd been exhibiting signs of paranoia and you know mental distress they would have stayed behind um so it, it, either way this brain injury doesn't explain why his body's never found and if he's still alive why he hasn't been traced i don't know enough as to speculate how long a brain injury can last what the effects of that kind of knock on the head are you know one that could burst an eardrum how does that what part of that of the brain is affected but I know that dilated pupils from a brain injury is not a good thing, but obviously uh, uh, having a drink spiked or, or being continued to be spiked in some way would also explain the dilated pupils. So one thing I, I do want to talk about is from, from all accounts that I've read and watched, it seems that Lars perhaps wasn't as involved in the group activities with the others. I don't know if he was a bit of an outsider, whether he wasn't a great personality. Come, I say that as someone who is the same. Um, but he seems to be playing football on the beach with strangers that he's met while he's there, while his friends lie by the pool. I've been to McDonald's with friends when I didn't want to get a McDonald's. But you go in, you're chatting, you go in and wait with them. You don't stand outside. I don't think he was a smoker. Maybe he was, but it's he doesn't. He disappears for a few hours and gets into a fight. He's he's fighting with these other fans in the bar. He seems to be the one that's arguing with the rival football fans. 
I just find that dynamic very interesting between the friendship group. Was he being a bit of a pain in the ass to travel with? Was he always the one that did stuff by himself? Did he, how well did he know the friends he was traveling with? Because could it be that he knew one of them really well, he wanted to go on the holiday, but, you know, he kind of did his own thing a bit. That's very interesting to me because if he was being a, a bit of an ass, then that would explain why maybe they they didn't really want to stay with him. Um, or, I don't know, I just feel like, is he is he a, the problem in this friendship dynamic? Did they all get in a fight? It's very much put across like he got into the fight and his friends pulled him out, but it was a non-physical fight. Uh, it's, that's all very weird. In 2019, a German truck driver gave a hitchhiker a ride from Dresden to Schildau, sorry for my German pronunciation, uh, in Brandenburg. And the driver became aware of the Lars Matank case after he had given this hitchhiker a ride. And he said that the man he picked up resembled an older version of Matank. The driver said that the man had long hair, a beard, his eyes seemed tired and his cheekbones were prominent. He seemed convinced it was Lars that he'd picked up, but the, the man that he did pick up has never been traced. So we have no idea. It w would be lovely if it was him, but again, I, I've got so many questions about the way the brain works. He was obviously very paranoid. He was obviously convinced someone was out to get him. He got into some form of incident where he was injured. So does that paranoia continue over? I would like to think that if I had amnesia or I lost, you know, I didn't know who I was or where I was, that I would ask someone to help. But he's obviously very paranoid so maybe he is too afraid to ask anyone for help. It seems very unusual. I also want to know if this German hitchhiker had a conversation with this guy. Um, so the theory that I have, and there is no evidence for this, so it could be shot down by those who know more than me. I would have thought that if anything, the rival football fans would have dosed him for being a wanker rather than hiring a hit. The, the hiring a hit for me is an absolute non-starter, but I don't. I think they may have dosed him with some GHB or something, and for, that could account for his disappearance. It could explain the resulting paranoia. It could explain him having injuries that perhaps he doesn't remember how he got or he hallucinated that he's being beaten up. Whereas in fact, you know, he was hitting his head or, you know, it would explain a lot of things and it could in some, um, cause a sort of psychotic break inducing paranoia and, and memory loss in the running away. But I'm not sure if he was still alive whether he would still not know who he is and be wondering about. It would also explain the dilated pupils. But again, I don't know about the long-term effects. I know I know plenty of people, well, plenty of people, enough people, sadly, who have taken drugs that have then induced mental illnesses of, of all ranges, so that it is possible that he was spiked and it just tripped something in his brain um that tipped him over but i find it very weird that nobody's been found especially as as a mother i'm sure so I'm, I'm fairly sure this is what sandra will have done i would go to the place that he was last seen and i would just crawl through it on my hands and knees in an attempt to find him um so I'm fairly sure she's she's been there and she's done that and she's had the private investigator do that. The private investigator found nothing. Um, and, you know, he's wearing a neon yellow T-shirt. So that is the story 
of the disappearance of Lars Matank. If you are into it, there is so much available for you to watch and listen to and read. But as I say, I feel like it because of that, it's become one of those cases that is so diluted. Like even words and language that I've used in this episode could influence the way someone else tells the story that could be completely non-factual. So I, as much as I'm, I love this kind of story, I do always feel a bit like, oh, I don't want to be putting misinformation or facts out there that, you know, that aren't right but it is incredibly fascinating and I feel I just feel for his whole family I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and you're having a lovely start to the summer we have mosquito wars going on here so I, I I'm hope that I'm taking the the brunt for all of you on the mosquito wars as always, I love to have your recommendations. If you're a Pendle Witch on Patreon, you're going to start getting minisodes soon. I'm shamelessly stealing that term from my favourite murder because it, it says it says what it is. It's a, a mini episode for everything. That, there are just so many cool stories that are just not long enough for a full episode. So the minis will be up on the patreon and you can send me an email at the monday night review at gmail.com you can follow us on instagram facebook tiktok where all the kids are at the monday night review and i'd love to hear from you so send me a message and until next time be kind stay safe always check the back seat before you drive